Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. Today we're in 1 Corinthians. We're getting close to the end. We come to chapter 14, and we resume our study in verse 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 21. The Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at the Bible verse by verse dot com. And you can study all of the Bible three complete times at that website. Begin in Genesis, go through all 66 books of the Bible, and get yourself a Bible college education. More Bible than what you will probably receive if many, not all, Bible colleges today at the Bible verse by verse dot com study at your pace at your convenience it'll change your life because it is the Word of God and that is the most important thing on earth let's pray father we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth your word is truth in Jesus name amen Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I want to go back, and I don't normally do this, but I want to backtrack a little bit and uh, backtrack about seven verses and begin in verse 13. Therefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue Pray that he may interpret. Because at least that way, others will know what God the Holy Spirit has said in that unknown language. Otherwise, no one knows. Verse 14. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Praying in tongues is the Holy Spirit actually bypassing our minds and praying directly to the Father. He's just using our tongue. He's using our voice. And so, given that, it is perfect prayer. It totally bypasses man's flesh. It bypasses our sin nature. So there's no chance of it being corrupted by our own thoughts or our own words. I guess the more that God can leave us out of something, the more pure it is. Verse 15. He says, What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Balance is important in a Christian's life. As a rule, it's best to avoid the extreme positions on biblical issues. Verse 16. Else, when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupies the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understands not what thou sayest? For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. Speaking in tongues is good, but it's only good for the one who's doing it. We saw this last time. When you speak in tongues, you're talking to God, you're praying to God. And even though you don't understand it, if you're the one doing it, you're being edified because your spirit is fellowshipping with God's spirit. So on the inside, you're being edified, even though your mind doesn't know what's really going on. So it is a good thing, but only for the one who's doing it. Verse 18. I thank God that I speak with tongues more than ye all. So, so much for putting down the gift of tongues. As we talked about last program or the program before, some people do that. You better watch it. Paul said, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than you all. You put, you put speaking in tongues down as being a selfish 
selfish thing to do. You're going to answer to the Apostle Paul. Now, I know there's a lot of abuse. And uh, if I was a betting man, I'd bet that most of it, if not all of it, is just a bunch of phony baloney. But there is a legitimate gift of tongues. It's in the Bible. And you can twist the scripture any way you want, but you'll never make it say that, that it has stopped or that God doesn't do it anymore or he can't do it anymore or some other such foolish thing. The Apostle Paul was not selfish. And he said he speaks in tongues more than any, or he spoke in tongues more than anybody else. So to say that, to attack it by saying it's, it's selfishness is really foolish. Verse 19. Yet in the church, and this was, this is, I think, a very important verse. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also, than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. You know, the, the hour or so that Christians meet for church should be used in the most efficient way. And that, of course, would be communicating the Word of God in an understandable way. Tongues doesn't cut it. Let it be private. Let it be a private thing between you and God. But when you're at church... That should be dedicated to the Word of God. Verse 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding. However, it may be, in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. In other words, God says grow up spiritually. Be innocent when it comes to evil and be strong and mature at being holy. Verse 21. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord, which just goes to show that miracles won't cause a sinner to repent if the word of God won't cause that sinner to repent. Miracles won't cause a sinner to repent if a person's heart is hardened against the word of God. They'll just find a reason to mock it or to explain it away. Verse 22. Therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to those who believe not. But prophesying serveth not those who believe not, but those who believe. And remember, last time I explained that prophesying is not just predicting the future which it was a part of, a small part. Prophesying, for the most part, is proclaiming the word of God. And back when the New Testament was being written, like in the days of the Apostle Paul and the other apostles, they didn't have the completed Bible. And many churches didn't have, you know, many books of the Bible. They might have had, you know, one or two or whatever, and that was it. And so God spoke directly through prophets and sometimes through the gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues to, to make that connection between him and his people. Now we have the written word of God, and it's a wonderful thing. We have the whole counsel of God. But clearly from verse 22, God is saying that the church is for Christians, and, and Christians need to be fed the word of God more than they need to be tickled by supposed supernatural things such as speaking in tongues. I say supposed because today, especially, but even back then, there was a lot of phone, phony tongue talking going on. Verse 23. If therefore the whole church come together into one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are unlearned or unbelievers. Will they say, will they say they are, that ye are mad? And of course, they sure will. And that same thing happens today as well. So you have a lost soul who is tired of the world, 
tired of sin and he's searching for truth and he stumbles into a charismatic church and he hears a bunch of people babbling gibberish supposedly speaking in tongues and that searching sinner thinks these people are all crazy get me out of here and he knows he's got the discernment to know that this doesn't make sense it happens it happens and it's a dirty shame when nonsense like that is done in the name of Christ because it can turn searching sinners away from the Bible and from Jesus verse 24 but if all prophesy and there come in one that believeth not or is unlearned he is convinced by all and is judged by all see there's a difference between ecstatic speech speaking in tongues emotionalism and all the crazy nonsense that so often goes on in Pentecostal churches and the pure Word of God if that same searching soul walks into a church where the Word of God is being proclaimed clearly and and he definitely is searching and he wants truth it'll click with him and he'll get saved but that same person if he's searching for truth walks into the type of church that was described previously he's gonna think you're all crazy God's not gonna use that but he always uses the Word of God especially when somebody's heart is really searching for truth that's fertile ground and it needs the seed of God's Word to be planted on it so it takes root and produces salvation and later on sanctification as well 25 and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest and so falling down on his face he will worship God and report that God is in you in the truth boy the power of the Word of God that's exactly what this is talking about the secrets of his heart will be exposed he walks into a place and they're proclaiming the Word of God he'll think that that preacher knows his life story and is preaching directly to him the Holy Spirit will nail him right to the wall and reveal all of his sins and all the things that he needs to change that's the power of God's Word because the Word of God cuts right to the heart of a person and convicts people of their sin and their need of a Savior and the more clearly that the Word of God is proclaimed the easier it is for the Holy Spirit to get right down to business in the hearts and the minds of people the Word of God works which is why it should be the major part of any Christian service verse 26 how is it then brethren when ye come together every one of you hath a psalm hath a doctrine hath a tongue hath a revelation hath an interpretation let all things be done for edification now a good balanced Christ-centered church service with music and the Word of God that is the biblical way to go verse 27 if any man speak in an unknown tongue let it be by two or at the most by three and then in turn and let one interpret in other words get rid of the chaos in the church if you're going to exercise these spiritual gifts then do it in an orderly fashion verse 28 but if there be no interpreter let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God in other words don't waste the people's times the people's time when they come to church people come to worship people at least solid Christians come to worship and come to be edified and and so that's the way that the service should go by proclaiming the Word of God so that can happen verse 29 let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge in other words there needs to be discernment in the church let the others judge how many times you people hear people say even in your so-called Bible believing church well we shouldn't judge my goodness where do you get that from if you get that from your pastor 
or your Bible teachers, then you're, you're in big trouble going to that church. I heard one guy, I, I think I mentioned this several programs ago. Um, I heard one guy on radio. Supposedly, well, you know, if you're on radio, your Christian radio station, uh, whether, whether you want it or not, people are going to look to you as being a leader. And they, him and his co-host were talking about a sin. It was a blatant, in-your-face sin. And they were talking about it. And then the host of the show said, well, I'm not the judge. And I thought to myself, well, then what are you? What do you mean you're not the judge? God tells us to use discernment. And right here, he says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. We're to judge between what is right and wrong, what is of God and what is not of God. And you, in a position of leadership, you stand there, you say, you're not the judge? Well, you know, that sounds so open-minded. So what you are just doing is giving anything and anyone a license to sin, and you can't say that it's wrong. Totally unbiblical. There needs to be discernment in the church. And you can't have discernment without the Word of God, and you can't have discernment without taking that Word and making a value judgment, comparing it to what's going on, what's being taught, what's being said, someone's behavior, and making a judgment saying it's wrong it's right there needs to be discernment in the church even over this gift of prophecy which is what he's talking about here in verse 29 just because someone says i have a word from god doesn't mean he has a word from god doesn't mean you should believe him or her in fact if somebody says that today i have a word from god which i have heard several times i'd say well, no thank you. No thank you. I have the real word of God in the scripture. And God says he's done writing it. So uh, you say you have a word from God, like I told one guy one time. Well, then you better do the signs of an apostle. You better do the signs of a prophet. If you're proclaiming the word of God and you're telling me to do something that I know is contrary to scripture, which he was, and I was just toying with him at that point because I knew he wasn't a prophet. I said, well, then I was trying to bring him face to face with his own folly. I said, well, then do a sign of a prophet. He, called, he told me I was of the devil and he stormed out angry. I guess I was just supposed to take his word at face value and he didn't like to be challenged, even if it was contrary to the word of God. And don't think he's alone because he isn't. And we have the complete word of God in the Bible which the early church didn't have. So beware of pious sounding people who say, God spoke to me, God told me this, and I have a word from God for you. No, thank you. I'll get the word of God out of the Bible and I'll pray and have the Holy Spirit apply it to my life the way he wants to. Verse 30. If anything be revealed to another who sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be comforted. And again, there was a need for prophecies and revelations, especially in the early church because the scriptures had not yet been completed. Now we have the complete revelation of God. And God even says in the last book of the Bible, in the last paragraph, don't add to my word. Don't take away from it. There's verse 32. Now look at this. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion. You know what that means? The spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. That means God may give you the gift of prophecy, but you have the power to turn it off and off. You have the power to turn it off. God will not force you to speak his word. The spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. You have the final word whether you want to be used by God or not. If you have, let's say, the gift of tongues, you have the power to speak those words. The Holy Spirit doesn't grab a hold of you, shake your head, 
and force you to say words in another language. That's not how it works. He'll give you the words in your mind, but you have to choose to speak it. You have the gift of teaching. You can use that gift that God gives you, or you can say, no, I don't want to use it. The spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets, not just when it comes to the gift, but that's how the Holy Spirit operates in general. The Holy Spirit is not overbearing. The Holy Spirit will not force you to do anything. And so I talked about this, I think, a few a few programs ago, where I, I had a phone call from someone that I, uh, that I had known several years before. And uh, she was telling me how she had been going to this Pentecostal church. And it was just wonderful. Oh, the Spirit of God is moving, she was. And then she proceeded to tell me how the Spirit of God moved. Oh, you know, the Spirit of God grabs a hold of us and he knocks us to the ground and we can't get up. I was knocked to the ground, she said, and I could not get up. I was pinned. I tried and I couldn't get up. And she thought I was going to be impressed with that. And then she said, and I couldn't see. And finally, when the Holy Spirit let me up, I wanted to read the Bible. But when I looked at the Bible, the Holy Spirit clouded my eyes. I couldn't see the word of God. I don't know how long I talked to her. But I went, and I don't remember everything that she said, but I went right down the line. And everything that she said was of the Holy Spirit was not of the Holy Spirit. None of it was. Because it all contradicted the Word of God, and I, and I explained how it all contradicted the Word of God. She just kept going. Because you're not going to talk people out of that. If they're not... If the Word of God isn't the most important thing in their life, and it's not the standard, which it should be, you're not going to talk them out of anything. They're going to they're going to keep going where they get this buzz. And they're told that's the Holy Spirit. It wasn't the Holy Spirit. You judge everything by the Word of God, and so we do have that complete Word of God. But there and there and there was a need for prophecies and revelations in those days. But you know. God works in an orderly manner. And some Christians think that the only time the Holy Spirit is leading in a church service is when everything is spontaneous and everything is unplanned and everything is uncontrolled and there's foolishness like this that goes on. Well, that was a Holy Spirit-inspired service. It had nothing in the world to do with the Holy Spirit. I know that because the Holy Spirit wrote the book. And if, and if something happens that contradicts the book that he wrote, guess who that's not from? That's not from the Holy Spirit. The Word of God we know is from the Holy Spirit. But the experience or the words or whatever is done that contradicts the Word of God, that's not of the Holy Spirit. That's how you judge it. So don't get the idea that something, just because it seems to be supernatural, or is exciting, that means it's of the Holy Spirit. That means it's of God. It's, that doesn't mean that at all. Verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as it is in all the churches of the saints. And then he goes on, he switched gears here, and he says, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience as also, excuse me, as also saith the law. The Bible teaches that in the church, the Christian women should not be in positions where they instruct men. That's what this is talking about. Verse 35. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Women are not to take the position, the role of a leadership in the church. And women are to be modest. And they are to stay away from anything that would come across as being ostentatious or draw attention to themselves. They should not be in the spotlight in any way in church. That's why women need to be careful how they dress. Not to draw attention to themselves. They should not be in positions where they have the attention of the people. That's unbiblical. Verse 36. 
What? Did the word of God come out from you? Or did it come unto you only? The Corinthian church thought that they were really special. They did. They thought they they thought the other local churches were behind the times. They had all these new movements, these latest evangelical fads and these latest charismatic type fads. They thought they were on the cutting edge of God's revelation, boy. Things were really happening there. And of course, if what they taught or practiced was contrary to the apostles' doctrine, which the apostles were teaching in that day, which we now have in the written word of God, if what they taught or their behavior or what they practiced was contrary to what the apostles taught, then it wasn't their fault. It was the apostles. They were the ones who were mistaken. Just like people set aside the word of God today in order to feel comfortable in the unbiblical things that they are doing. Wrong choice. Verse 37. If any man thinketh himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. In other words, no one has a right to teach something that is contrary to the Bible and then call it Christian. And if someone does teach something unorthodox, then that person should be rejected as a false teacher and called out publicly. If they're teaching publicly, they need to be called out publicly. 39. Therefore, brethren, aspire to prophesy and forbid not the speaking with tongues. So, those who would say that all speaking in tongues is of the devil, as some do today, are going way too far. Number one, you can't back that kind of a statement with Scripture. You just can't. Just be careful not to allow your own prejudices, your own desires, your likes and dislikes. Be careful not to twist the Scripture to try to make it seem as if they are biblical when they are not. Just let the Word of God say what it wants to say. Accept it or reject it, but don't add to the Word of God. Don't take away from it. But there's a lot of abuse, abuse in this matter today um, in, the, in the matter of speaking in tongues. I know that. I know that. But he says, forbid not. So it's not right. In spite of all the abuse, it's not right to put God in a box and say, he doesn't do it anymore, period. Not, not if God hasn't said that. And he hasn't. So we have no right to say it. Verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. And again, God is not the author of confusion in the church or any place else. Christians who speak so piously, you know, oftentimes against Christian formal leadership in the church and orderliness in the church are often the type of people who want to run the show themselves. I've noticed that over the years. You know, they'll come down against authority. They'll come down against orderliness in the church and in favor of the quote-unquote leading of the Holy Spirit. We need a church where the Holy Spirit leads. And of course, they're the type of people that come up with this brainstorm. They forget the fact that God has ordained leadership in the church. And, and it's been my experience anyway that those are the type of people that equate their desires and their feelings and their words from God with the leading of the Holy Spirit. And boy, oh boy, if someone rejects their pious nonsense and in favor of God's word, they insist on leaving that place and going to a spirit-led church. In other words, one that is open to words from God, especially the ones that I speak, and being so piously labeled, led by the Holy Spirit, when it's not. You want a church that's led by the Holy Spirit? You find a church that teaches in the Word of God, verse by verse, the whole counsel of God, because he wrote it all, out of time. You can continue studying the Word of God at thebibleversebyverse.com. Check it out, study the whole Bible, and if the Lord leads, and I hope he does, because we're brought to you by your prayers and financial support, 
You can give in a secure method by clicking the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com. I'm out of time. Until next time, so long, everyone.